Welcome to Whiskey Cast, Cask Strength Conversation, featuring news and interviews from the world of whiskey. I'm Mark Gillespie. This is episode number 744 for December 9th, 2018. Coming up in just a few minutes. We're finally get, get, gaining back power. <laughs> it's, it, you know, it's, it is incredible to think, you know, here we are with the Irish whiskey industry. We're all excited about what's happened, the growth, but we're still, you know, only fifth in the world behind the Japanese, behind the Canadians, behind the Americans and behind the Scots. Bernard Walsh heads up the Walsh Whiskey Company in County Carlow, Ireland, but he has a big picture view of the entire Irish whiskey industry. Ireland's distillers founded the Irish Whiskey Association back in 2014. He was named its first chairman. My conversation with Bernard Walsh is coming up later on Whiskey Cast in Depth. Along with the What I'm Tasting This Week department, your voice, and a whole lot more. It's all ahead on this episode of Whiskey Cast. This is Whiskey, Johnny Walker's Scotch Whiskey. From this place and these people, I, Scotch Makers, creating the bold and complex flavour of Johnny Walker Black Label. Step right up. Whiskey Cast, brought to you by Redbreast, the definitive single pot still Irish whiskey. Those in the know, know Redbreast. Let's get started with the news. It's brought to you by Highland Park. We've had another case of executive turnover in the whiskey industry. Edrington CEO Ian Curl announced his plans to retire this March after 15 years in that post. He will be succeeded by Scott McCroskey, who is currently the McAllen's managing director. This is the third CEO change announced in 2018, Lawson Whiting will take over for Paul Varga at Brown Foreman January 1st following Varga's retirement. And at Constellation Brands, Bill Newlands will become the company's president and CEO March 1st as current CEO Rob Sands becomes executive chairman of the family-controlled business. One other management change to report, Lisa Wicker has been named president and head distiller at Widow Jane Distillery in Brooklyn, New York. She had been consulting for Widow Jane's owner, Samson and Surrey, but that led to one thing and another. You know, it seemed like I was spending all my time at Widow Jane, um, and after the consulting, uh, several months ago, it must have been late spring, Robert Furness Rowe, who runs Samson and Surrey, asked me to come on full-time with Samson and Surrey. And so I came on as vice president over um, distilling and product development, and that didn't last very long. And he talked to me and said, how about moving to Brooklyn and being president of Widow Jane? And first, you know, I just looked at him (laughs) like, oh, my gosh. Um, And, you know, thought about it. And it's just such an amazing opportunity. And I've loved my work here so much that I told him, yes, I would do that. So um, I've been president now for a month officially. And it's been a wild ride. And you're supervising the whole operation, not just distilling, but the visitor center and everything, right? Yes, yes, yes. Overseeing heirloom corn project that we worked on, we grew over 1,500 acres between Kentucky, Pennsylvania, and New York State. Um, Pennsylvania, the, the farmer there had already worked with Widow Jane for five years on this open pollinated cross. That's, you know, we've got it trademarked as Baby Jane. So he grew seed corn again for us this year. And then upstate New York, of course, we want production corn for New York from New York. And so just off of Seneca Lake, found um, a family that used to be dairy farmers, and now they are growing open pollinated corn and agreed to do the project for us. And they're doing some remarkable work up there. So all of our production corn for New York will be coming from there. And then because of looking at projections ahead, we knew we needed more stock than we had. When I took this project on last year, I inherited like 26,000 bushels of the baby Jane. (laughs) And we brought that back to Kentucky and distilled it. And, you know, I I will let you know where that was as soon as I'm allowed to do that. And then this year, um, we had Peterson Farms in Kentucky grow our corn. Bernard Peterson, he grows for Maker's Mark. Um, He grows for Sazerac. 
Um, and I knew that's who I wanted because he does it best. And fortunately for me, his daughter lives in New York and I convinced him to come visit the distillery and, and within a matter of minutes, he said, yeah, I think I'm going to consider this project. And so they had been approached by several craft distillers and never said yes. And, um, so we were their first heirloom corn project. So, um, it was a lot of fun. I spent one afternoon in the combine and, um, Scott, their agronomist, he, we were talking and he's like, we've gotten so many phone calls like, what's wrong with this corn? <laughs> There's something wrong with your corn because it looks so different than all the hybrids that, you know, or the other corns that they're conventional corns that they're used to growing for whiskey. So that was a remarkable project. And we had ended up with breaking yields and yield records and things. And we have over 100,000 bushels of baby Jane corn. So um, we're in Kentucky, so I'm back and forth between Kentucky and Brooklyn. Um, so I'm still overseeing the distilling there. Um, I don't mash like everybody else. It's a little unconventional. And so um, where we're doing that is allowing me to do my little a bit of unconventional cooking, which I've discovered works better with the heirlooms. So anyway, that's where we're at. Well, I have to ask, at what point are you going to be able to start transferring all of your distilling to Brooklyn? Because that's been a um, sore point for well, a lot of folks in the past. Yes, and that's what is happening. That's exactly why I was hired, um, because I built a small distillery in Bardstown and then a winery before that when I was still making wine. That's part of the reason I was brought on. So, um, and here full time, and the position that I have now is to expand our operations in New York. I can't give you any answers on that yet because nothing's been solidified. You know, we have all of the plans, preliminary plans on paper. And um, things are coming fast, but there's not anything that I can share just yet. I will I promise as soon as I can, <laughs> I'll let you know. And at that point in time, what we'll do, too, is we're going to start shifting the corn growing from Kentucky but all to upstate New York. And as the demand for corn here increases and decreases in Kentucky, we'll continue to shift that. Both farmers are aware that's the plan, and everybody seems rather accepting of it. So I like to think within three years, we will have all of our corn grown in New York, and all of it will be processed in New York. Wicker will continue to consult as needed on other Samson and Surrey projects and will also continue her volunteer work at George Washington's Distillery at Mount Vernon in Virginia. Last month, she wrote the mash bill as they laid down barrels of the first bourbon ever distilled at Mount Vernon. There's been a shakeup in the U.S. whiskey festival scene, and it's already creating a bit of confusion among some consumers. The festivals that have been known for years as Whiskey Live in New York City, Washington, Chicago, and other U.S. cities are getting a new name. They'll be known from now on as Whiskey and Barrel Night. That's because there's been a breakup between Paragraph Publishing, which publishes Whiskey Magazine and owns Whiskey Live, and Dave Sweet. His Chicago-area company produced the U.S. Whiskey Live events, while Dave served as the U.S. representative for Whiskey Magazine. Their contract ended after last month's Whiskey Live in Los Angeles. Well, after 15 years, Mark, of running the events and uh, running the magazine for a half dozen years, um, it was just time to go on different paths and different directions. Um, we wish Paragraph all the best, uh, but uh, we have run the shows entirely through our company, uh, so we are rebranding our shows and expanding the shows. So our mantra right now is rebranding and expanding, and uh, we will be in New York back at the Metropolitan Pavilion February 27th for the kickoff of Whiskey and Barrel Night. And it is all about the experience really getting into it, enjoying whiskey, making it a night out. A couple other little barrel-aged products here and there. I've been on a barrel-aged beer kick for a while, and we're going to be lining up the beers that are aged in the bourbon barrels and are hosting bourbons and a bunch of other fun things like that. And looking at expanding the experience. Same show, uh, same great venues, bigger, better name, bigger, better show. The rest of the Whiskey and Barrel Night schedule for 2019 will be announced at a later date. And as for the future of Whiskey Live, Paragraph Publishing's Whiskey Live website indicates that festivals will be held during 2019 in New York City, Chicago, and Washington as of now. 
but specific dates and venues have not yet been announced. We've asked Paragraph's Damian Riley Smith for additional details, and we'll have all of the dates for both festivals on our calendar of events at whiskeycast.com as soon as they're confirmed. On that note, Whiskey Magazine has inducted three new members into its Hall of Fame. Irish distillers master blender Billy Layton was named to the hall on the eve of Whiskey Live Dublin a couple of weeks ago, while Ben Riach master blender Rachel Berry and recently retired McAllen creative director Ken Greer both received the honor this week during the magazine's Scotland Icons of Whiskey Awards. Congratulations to all three. Former White & Mackay owner V.J. Malia has a court date Monday in London and could learn whether he'll be extradited to India to face fraud and money laundering charges. He left India for Great Britain two and a half years ago to avoid being arrested for what he claims are politically motivated charges stemming from the collapse of Kingfisher Airlines. Prosecutors and Malia's creditors claim that he borrowed more than a billion dollars from Indian banks to keep the airline in business, but never intended to repay the loans. Since he went into exile at an estate outside of London, his assets have been frozen worldwide, while his private jet, a yacht, and many of his real estate assets in India have been seized and sold to repay his creditors. He was also ousted by Diageo as chairman of India's United Spirits after auditors found company funds had been diverted to Kingfisher and other Malia-controlled companies before Diageo bought a controlling stake in United Spirits from him back in 2012. The drinks business reports the magistrate's ruling is expected to be appealed either way. Malia is likely to remain free on bond, during the appeals process. Turning now to new whiskeys, Buffalo Trace is expanding its experiments with barrels made from different types of oak trees and will use its old charter bourbon brand to bring those whiskeys to market. The first release in what's being called the Old Charter Oak Series was matured for 10 years in Mongolian oak, It'll be available starting this month in limited amounts for about $70 a bottle. And the distillery plans releases with two other types of oak during 2019. Campari is expanding the Whiskey Barons series of whiskeys that are distilled at Wild Turkey in Kentucky, but carry the names of some of the historic distilling families that lived and made whiskeys around Lawrenceburg, Kentucky, back before Prohibition. The series made its debut in the spring of 2017 with Old Rippy and the Bond and Lillard bourbons that were recreated to match the original whiskeys as closely as possible. Now, Wild Turkey's Eddie Russell has created a new W.B. Saffle bourbon and taken a second crack at Bond and Lillard. I'm really excited about I'm re-releasing the Bond and Lillard, but we actually... Got a, a little bit of 1917 Bond and Lillard, so a little closer to what it tasted like. But the one I'm really excited about is called W.B. Saffle. That was another family in Lawrenceburg that made whiskey before Prohibition. We couldn't find any of it. We got some tasting notes, and selfishly, I would rather put my name on it than W.B. Saffle, but I think it's a fantastic liquid. Six to 13 years old, it's going to be 107 proof, non chill filtered. Uh, just amazing liquid. How hard is it to recreate these old recipes when all you've got to work with is tasting notes? Well, it, it's tough. I mean, we only have our one recipe, so it goes about the taste profile. Bond and Lillard, I actually have to do quite a bit of stuff with carbonated uh, charcoal just to get it to the level that it is from the wild turkey. Uh, the W. Savile was a little more like us back in the day. A real bourbon had a lot of character and a lot of flavor. That's what the Saffles got. Both whiskeys are working their way out to retailers now and are available at the Wild Turkey Visitors Center in Lawrenceburg. Eddie Russell still has 10 more families to work with in the project. Of course, Basil Hayden is one of the legendary names in Kentucky bourbon. 
The original Basil Hayden was making whiskey in Kentucky in the years following the Revolutionary War. Now, Beam Suntory is adding its first 10-year-old Basil Hayden's bourbon to the range. It's the second new Basil Hayden's whiskey this year, following the release of the 2x2 two two rye a couple of months ago. The 10-year-old is a limited-edition bourbon bottled at 40% ABV and will sell for around $60 a bottle. The Virginia Distillery Company is launching a new Journey Cask Collection featuring single malts from around the world that honors people who helped play a role in developing the distillery. The first release is Hibernia. It's an 11-year-old Irish single malt honoring the distillery's founder, the late Dr. George Moore, who grew up in Dundalk, Ireland, next to the Great Northern Brewery, and started working there when it opened back in 1965. Of course, that brewery is now John Teeling's Great Northern Distillery, and Dr. Moore's son Gareth sourced this whiskey from Great Northern's inventory of older casks. Regular listeners will note that the distillery itself is only a little over three years old now. Hibernia is available at the Virginia Whiskey Company's gift shop in Lovingston, Virginia, and online for around $125 a bottle. On the Scotch whiskey front, Gordon and McPhail's Ben Romick Distillery is releasing a 1978 vintage single malt. It's a single cask bottling from a refill sherry hogshead cask. Just 184 bottles will be available worldwide. The price? 1,250 pounds, around $1,600 U.S. Last week, we reported that Edrington has agreed to sell its Cuddy Sark blended Scotch whiskey brand to France's La Martini Case. The company also owns Level 5 blended Scotch and will be releasing a new limited edition Level 5 bottle designed by Lebanese artist Rami Mualem starting this March. His design was picked by consumers in an online competition between five artists in the Label of Five World Tour. You can keep up on the latest whiskey news all week long at whiskeycast.com. The news is brought to you by Highland Park, the Orkney single malt with Viking Soul. Looking for something unique to give as a gift this holiday season? You might have to search around, but there's more to the Highland Park lineup than you might think. For instance, Valknut is the latest release in Highland Park's Viking series. It's named for the mark that was placed on worthy Viking warriors in battle to ensure their safe passage into Valhalla. And certainly there's got to be somebody worthy of a Valknut on your gift list. There's also the Highland Park Single Cask Series, one-of-a-kind bottlings that are available only in specific regions. If you look hard enough, you just might find Single Cask Series bottlings right now in New York City, Boston, and other major cities, along with the travel retail market. Of course, if you look hard enough, you'll find a Highland Park for just about everyone on your gift list. Check out the entire lineup at highlandparkwhiskey.com. Time now for the Whiskey Cast calendar of events, and this time around we're going to do something different. With the holidays coming up, if you have a whiskey lover on your gift list or you just want to plan a gift for yourself, here are some of the events coming up in 2019 that might make a good gift idea. Woodford Reserve has announced the 2019 dates for its one-day Bourbon Academy classes that are held at the distillery in Versailles, Kentucky. They'll be held on March 2nd, June 22nd, and October 29th, and tickets are available now. Tickets for the Kentucky Bourbon Affair this June won't go on sale until February, but there's a gift package available now for $175, it includes $150 towards the cost of experiences during the bourbon affair, along with a gift certificate, bourbon swag, and shipping in the U.S. Now, the caveat is that some of those events may wind up costing more than that $150 down payment. 
Tickets are also on sale now for many of the major whiskey festivals, with the exception of the Spirit of Speyside Festival that runs from May 1st through the 6th. Those usually go on sale around the end of January. But tickets are on sale now for some of the island-wide events during the Isla Festival of Malt and Music at the end of May. The distilleries usually handle their own ticket sales for events at their open days, and those will be announced as the festival gets closer. If you're looking for a festival or a tasting as part of your travel plans for 2019, Right now, we have 152 different events available on our searchable calendar at whiskeycast.com, and we're adding new events all the time. Just click on the search button to find one near you or wherever you may be traveling in 2019. Seven swans a-swimming, six geese a-laying, four calling birds, three French hens, two turtle doves, and a partridge in a pear tree. All seems a little excessive, doesn't it? When there's one bird they really want this Christmas. Redbreast. The warm glow of ripe fruit, honeyed figs and crackling cinnamon. Proud sponsor of Whiskey Cast. And the perfect gift to slip under the tree. Whiskey Cast in Depth is brought to you by Lagavulin. The Irish whiskey industry made major gains in 2018, with sales continuing to grow worldwide and several new distilleries coming online. It also faced some challenges, including new public health legislation that will take effect over the next three years, with mandatory health warnings on bottles and new limits on off-license retailers. And, of course, there's the ongoing Brexit issue, and whether a hard border will be reimposed at some point between Northern Ireland and the Republic of Ireland. Four years ago, when Ireland's distillers formed the Irish Whiskey Association, they picked Bernard Walsh of Walsh Whiskey Company in County Carlow to be the association's first chairman. It's a post he held until 2016. Bernard and I sat down recently to talk about the state of Irish whiskey. I think the last time we had you on the show was 2014, 2015, when you were chairman of the Irish Whiskey Association. A lot of changes since then for the entire industry, hasn't there? Yes, Mark, it's uh, been an incredible roller coaster. Uh, in 2014, I, I chaired to 2016 the Irish Whiskey Association. Uh, at that stage, 2014, we still had only maybe four or five uh, distilleries with a few new ones coming on board, including ourselves. To look now where we've got 18 in just a handful of years, it's, you know, this is an incredible uh, sort of, I suppose, move uh, for the for the industry. And at the time, you know, we, we felt we knew there was something happening. We, you know, we could see the sales growing continually year after year through all, through the noughties. We knew there was a lot of work happening on the ground, with, you know, ourselves and, and other distillers. Um, and we needed to be organized. Uh, so the Whiskey Association was, you know, was organizing the troops. So it's everybody in, n- north of the island, south of the island, we're all in this together. It's, you know, it's great you know we're we're united in whiskey on this island but you also face a lot of challenges including that possibility that uh, you may not be united come sometime next spring if there's a hard border with brexit what's the big concern in the industry there um, well, I suppose the the first concern was the GI, the geographical indicator for which is Irish whiskey. Uh, you know, will that be recognised for the whole island? And that that has been sorted, that has been agreed. So both sides agree the GI is not affected. So that's the big the big plus. So whether you're in Antrim in the north making uh, Irish whiskey, or here in Carlo making Irish whiskey, you know it is all Irish whiskey. It's all good stuff. So the, that that was the, the, the most important, obviously. Uh, the hard border, uh, you know, we're, we're talking, you know, I suppose implications on, on tax and so forth and the movement of goods. There's a lot of movement between north and south on, on Irish whiskey. And, uh, you know, we, we don't welcome a hard border. Especially since the Good Friday Agreement precludes that hard border officially. You're not just looking at issues for the whiskey industry. You're looking at issues for both sides of the border and Millions of people here, right? 
Yes, and nobody, North or South, want a hard border because we've lived, uh, you know, it's uh, 20 years now without uh, a hard border, without military posts and people with guns pointing down at you because you want to just go and visit your cousin in Belfast. And both sides of the community up there and down here just like the fact that we can move freely and we want that to continue. Uh, Nobody wants to see a return to dark days. Um, And, you know, by putting a hard border, we're giving an excuse to the extremists and we don't want to do that. Let's turn to another issue that's created some controversy. The public health alcohol bill that recently passed in the Dáil and will take effect over the next three years gradually Really, in a lot of ways, it can be said that uh, the doll, what they gave you with the craft spirits bill, they took away with the public health alcohol bill in terms of making distilleries like this economically viable from a tourist standpoint. Uh, yes, you know it's um, and and you know, we always say about you know our our, our politicians that they, they they can speak out of two, two two sides of the mouth and that's what we have here. You know we've we've got a great bill with on the on the craft side to allow the the, the smaller producer uh, sell um, uh, without having to buy a publican's license. They can sell from their distillery and that's most welcome. Uh, but you know, for me, I see it as an own goal. What's happened uh, with, um, in particular, the cancer labelling on whiskey? So where does it stop? I would say most processed products probably should carry the same. And you know, we're all you know uh, very aware of the dangers of cancer and uh, other diseases, and, and to take that serious. Um, um, I'm sure there are certain liver diseases which have to go as well. I think in the U.S., you, you, we know you've got a big government warning on the back of the U.S. labels, um, but that's you know that's we would have happily accepted that. Uh, but to pick out specific, you know, cancer, well, wow, well, um, I would think you know maybe uh, Irish salmon will have to carry it next. Almost anything would. I mean, if you're not going to put cancer warning labels on Roundup for crying out loud, why would we put them on whiskey? Yeah, no, it's it, it, it's a serious. It's a it, for me. It's a it's an own goal. It's and uh, you know I have, I suppose I'm hoping that uh, Europe come to our rescue here. This all still has to go through your, uh, you know, through Europe, and there's there are steps and stages over the next three years. So, um, you know, maybe 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 Mother Europe will will come to our rescue. I had a fun conversation with John Cashman from Cooley about the whole Brexit thing, and he said that uh, he was laughing about this, that the Irish Whiskey Association, after Brexit, is now going to be the leader in the European spirits industry because the Scottish guys won't be part of it anymore. Absolutely. We're finally get, get, gaining back power. <laughs> it's, it, you know, it's, it is incredible to think, you know, here we are with the Irish whiskey industry. We're all excited about what's happened, the growth, but we're still, you know, only fifth in the world behind the Japanese, behind the Canadians, behind the Americans and behind the Scots. And, you know, without the Scots in the uh, European spirits movement, uh, you know, it's, it's a sad day. Part of the infrastructure issues that the Irish whiskey industry is facing could also be described as an own goal on the politicians' side because I've seen at least two warehousing projects that have been shot down this year by local councils at the county level because people didn't want whiskey warehouses in their area, even if it was going to be in an industrial zone or rezoning farmland. Is that the next big challenge that this industry faces in Ireland, is securing enough warehousing space? Uh, yeah, Mark, uh, uh, you're right. It is, it is a big challenge. Uh, while the big distillers, you know, they've got their own warehousing complexes and they're, you know, well-established and uh, amazing facilities. For the small independent, you know, there are no independent uh, warehousing suppliers uh, kitted out for barrel maturation store uh, st- uh, warehouses. Uh, you have them in Scotland. Uh, you've got plenty. Uh, in Ireland, you don't. And we need a program, you know, whether it's done centrally in an organized way with government blessing, but, you know, we, we do need proper uh, uh, maturation warehouses built for the, the SMEs, the small to medium-sized distillers. Where do you guys warehouse your whiskey at Walsh? Uh, we, we warehouse uh, in uh, Kilkenny. 
Uh, so with a, a bonded warehouse uh, set up there in Kilkenny Customs and Excise Control, yeah. And you can set up your own, or would that have been something that would have been far too difficult to get through just getting a distillery built here? Um, our priority was building a distillery and getting liquid flowing. Um, now that that's bedded in, we said the next move would be warehousing. So we actually, when we applied for planning here for the distillery, we also uh, got planning approval for maturation warehouses, so up to 60,000 barrel warehouse at the time. Yeah, so that will be sort of one of the, the future projects. What are you hearing from your colleagues in terms of their ability to find warehousing for their whiskies? They're all saying it's difficult. And with, I suppose, regulation, like, you know, there's lots of warehousing. Let's not, uh, there's lots of warehousing in this country, but uh, maturation warehouses are different. You know, it's, it's, it's not whiskey till it comes out the other end. You know, it goes in as spirit, it comes out as whiskey. So it's still part of the production process or the, uh, as we see it. And the regulation around matur- maturation warehouses, it's, you know, extre- it's very, very high. So, you know, you can imagine the fire officer, nothing happens without the fire officer giving, giving its blessing. So uh, where you locate your, your warehouses uh, of interest to him, your fire water retention, your, um, I suppose, ATEX requirements in terms of the electrics, lighting, and so forth. Uh, the cost of a, a maturation warehouse is so much more than a normal warehouse. So it's a big challenge uh, for the, the small distillers to find appropriate uh, warehousing for their barrels that meet regulation. Uh, so it needs investment. And it needs government support as well, right? How much support are you getting from the government in Dublin now? With the change in leadership from and to Kenny a couple of years ago to Leo Varadkar as Taishak. Are you getting more help or are you getting less help these days? Um, well, we deal with, I suppose, a number of government bodies, so Enterprise Ireland being one, and they've been very, very supportive to us throughout, regardless of what, what government. Um, now, uh, I suppose uh, Leo Varadkar was the Minister for Health prior to becoming uh, Taishak, and uh, you know, he was very much uh, pushing the current uh, alcohol bill that's just been passed. So um, we've sort of talked about that. So probably not a big fan of this industry. Uh, whereas, thankfully, uh, members of his party who are local here, uh, once you know Pat Deering, they've been hugely supporting, supportive of us and bringing the message back to Dublin that actually uh, the whiskey industry is ideally suited to the countryside. It doesn't need to be in a city. It can operate in deepest rural Ireland, bring jobs, bring tourism. Uh, this is the perfect solution. You know, Irish whiskey can only be made in Ireland. It, it can sit side by side with the farms uh, in deepest rural Ireland. We're here in the barley basket of Ireland. We're surrounded by barley fields. Well, it's, it's autumn now. So you, if you come back in spring, you'll, you, you'll, you'll, see, you'll see the green shoots again. So... We have got that support from uh, our local politicians. They have been very vocal, but, you know, it's the big city thing. Um, they're not hearing us in the big city. When we talked last time, as you were chairman of the association, you had just unveiled this big plan in 2016 for 10 years for Irish whiskey growth. We're a couple of years into that now. How far along are you, and are you surprised at how far you've gotten? Um, no, I'm not surprised. We're uh, we're we're ahead. We we said that uh, we'd planned um, 12 million cases by 2020. Uh, by the end of 2020, we'd uh, you know, Irish whiskey would. We, at the moment, current uh, projections, we're going to overshoot that. Um, also, with the number of new distilleries, uh, we've 18 um, up and running at the moment, and we have another 10 plus en route we need those people say oh you know is, is it going to be too many uh from where i'm sitting we need diversity we need depth and that's what they're bringing they're they're challenging i suppose the more established uh, distillers with the uh what's what's been put out as you know the standard fare for irish whiskey and broadening the category we need to deepen that okay maybe they won't all survive for different reasons and uh but for sure it's not that there isn't demand. There's demand for Irish whiskey. 
you know, we, I'll remind you know your listeners that we're still only fifth in the world behind the Japanese, the Australians, the Americans, and, and Scots. So we have a lot of work to do, and we need more distilleries. We need uh, more variances and, and differences in the taste and innovation. We need all of that. Thanks to Bernard Walsh for joining us on Whiskey Cast in depth. Full disclosure: Walsh Whiskey makes Writer's Tears, which is a sponsor of Whiskey Cast. But as always, full editorial control over this segment remains with Whiskey Cast. Whiskey Cast in depth is brought to you by Lagavulin, the legendary Isla single malt. Look for the new House Lannister Lagavulin nine-year-old. It's part of the Game of Thrones single malt Scotch whiskey collection from Diageo and HBO. Look for it at a whiskey shop near you, and check out the rest of the Lagavulin single malts at malts.com. The What I'm Tasting This Week department is brought to you by Heaven Hill Distillery. Let's start off with Forty Creek's Unity release. This one was selected by a group of Forty Creek fans picked in an online competition to choose the distillery's annual limited edition release. Unity is a complex blend that uses just a dash of Portuguese-style wine that was matured for 15 years in used Forty Creek barrels, and Unity is bottled at 43% ABV. The nose is warm with notes of toasted caramel and vanilla, along with honey, toffee, and dried fruits. The taste has toasted oak, caramel, and vanilla notes, along with black coffee, hints of dried fruits, and a slightly astringent mouthfeel with a nice pepperiness that develops slowly, then lasts through the finish. It eventually fades to a soft oakiness with hints of dried fruits. I'm scoring the 2018 Forty Creek Unity Canadian Whiskey a 93. Allison Park has released the latest batch of her brand 10-year-old French single malt, finished in cognac barrels. It's officially labeled the 2017 vintage, but she held it back until just recently. It's bottled at 48% ABV, and the nose is fruity and luscious with hints of orange marmalade, apricots, peaches, and touches of raspberries. The taste is thick and syrupy with good baking spices, balanced by fruity notes of orange marmalade, apricots, fresh berries, and peaches. And the finish is long as those notes gently fade away. Personally, I think it's the best Bren bottling yet, and I'm scoring the Bren 10-year-old 2017 vintage a 93. I'll have more tasting notes in just a minute, but first, our tasting notes are brought to you by Heaven Hill Distillery. Eighty-five years ago, as the end of Prohibition meant a renewed demand for Kentucky bourbon, Ed Shapira and his brothers invested in a new distillery in Bardstown. They bought out their partners later on, and today that little startup is the largest family-owned and operated distillery. Get the entire history at HeavenHillDistillery.com. Think wisely, drink wisely. Ireland's Dingle Distillery has released its third small-batch Irish single malt. It's a blend of 70% ex-bourbon and 30% port wine casks and bottled at 46.5% ABV. The nose is buttery and floral with dried fruits, hints of light spices, and just a touch of honey. The taste is thick and spicy with good baking spices, touches of tropical fruits, honey, and dried flowers. The finish has lingering spices and just a touch of fruit. I'm scoring Dingle's third small batch single malt release, a 93. Finally, I mentioned the latest Heaven's Door release briefly on last weekend's show. It's a 10-year-old Tennessee bourbon that's bottled at 50% ABV. The nose is warm and inviting, with notes of freshly baked bread, honey, toasted caramel, a hint of nuttiness, and just a touch of dark chocolate. The taste is a nice balance of tart and sweet, with white pepper, grilled pineapple, honey, toasted caramel, 
pipe tobacco, and a hint of oak smokiness. The finish is long and also nicely balanced with baking spices, toasted caramel, honey, and touches of cooked fruits. I'm scoring the Heaven's Door 10-year-old Tennessee bourbon a 91. I'll be adding these tasting notes to our searchable list of around 2,400 different whiskeys from all over the world. You'll find it at whiskeycast.com. This is whiskey. Johnny Walker's Scotch whiskey. From this place and these places in that place. These are the people that make it. This is what they sound like. Because you're a cheeky wee blighter. Dance like. I like that. This is what they do all day. Building the great character of Johnny Walker Black Label. Aging Hickian Oak for 12 long years. Thanks. Oh, it's gorgeous there. Oh. What is character? It's giving a damn. You're all right, lassie. Which looks like this, as much as this. See, the land that shapes these people and the people that shape this whiskey all shape how bloody good it tastes. Not the bloody game in the telly, Alan. A whiskey as bold as it is complex. For every step you take, this is Johnny Walker Black Label, friends. Step right up. Cup, cup. Can I drink this now? Johnny Walker Black Label Blended Scotch Whiskey. 40% alcohol by volume. Imported by Diageo North America, Norwalk, Connecticut. Please drink responsibly. Let's open up the inbox now for Your Voice, brought to you by Lot 40. The last time around, I answered Robert Polson II's question about the definition of the term bottled in bond. It did not take long for Zach McCabe of Augusta, Georgia, to email me. Hi, Mark. Thank you and the team for continuously producing amazing content. I've been a whiskey drinker for a few years now, but regrettably only discovered the podcast last spring. I've been catching up and listening to the new shows as they are released, too. In episode 743, you answered a question about what bottled in bond meant and the requirements for such a designation. I was confident that I knew the requirements, but then I heard you say that the spirit had to be bottled at no less than 50% ABV. I thought the requirement was exactly 50% this whole time. So my question is, I've never seen a spirit labeled bottled in bond that wasn't exactly 100 proof. Do you know of any that I might find on the shelf in my local liquor store? And any idea why we don't see greater than 100 proof spirits labeled bottled in bond? Cheers, Zach. Well, the reason you don't see them is because they don't exist. Zach, you're right. Bottled and bond whiskeys do have to be bottled at exactly 50% ABV. And that at no less than thing was a slip of the tongue on my part. Great catch, Zach, and thank you for calling me out on it. David Mara tweeted this note from Ennis, Ireland. Any idea when the Buffalo Trace Antique Collection will land in Ireland and in which shops? Well, good luck, David. The antique collection releases from Buffalo Trace are pretty hard to find in the U.S. and even rarer to find in export markets because they're usually bottled only in 750 ml bottles. A few do get out from time to time, though. Your best bet is to check with the major whiskey shops in Dublin just in case they've been able to track some down one way or another. Last time around... We went into detail on the U.S. Treasury Department Tax and Trade Bureau's proposed changes to the regulations for whiskey and other alcoholic beverages. As I recall, it took several minutes to go through all the major proposals, but on Twitter, Scott Harris of Virginia's Catoctin Creek Distillery didn't even need the full 280 characters. He only needed four words to tell us his opinion. Boo! Bad for craft. And he followed up with a tweet noting that they'll be filing their objections directly with the TTB. That public comment period ends on March 26th of 2019. Bobby Parnell at BDP 514 AM tweeted this from Texas the other day. 
what was the first whiskey that made you just sit back and go wow upon first taste? Mine was my first taste of Talisker, a Talisker 8-year-old back in the 80s. Up until then, my only brush with scotch had been Glenlivet. Bobby, I've got to admit that I am stumped on this one. I honestly cannot remember. And speaking of stumped, it looks like our latest Guess the Distillery challenge on social media this weekend was a stumper. I'll admit that's exactly what I was going for. After too many easy challenges in the past, where someone guessed the correct answer in just a few minutes. This time it was a slow-motion video looking down into a spirit safe as spirit was flowing off the still. But there was nothing in the picture to identify the distillery, and the spirit safe itself is the standard Forsyth's model that's used in distilleries all over the world. Lots of people tried, though. The guesses included Victoria Caledonian in Canada, along with Balconis, Talisker, Oban, Lafroig, and a couple of people who guessed Brooklady. No one guessed Ireland, though. It's the spirit safe at the Walsh Whiskey Company. But thanks to everybody who tried to figure it out. And finally, thanks to John at Whiskey Cat 1324 and at Bourbon Script, for sharing this quote from a Washington Post story on the earthquake the other day in Anchorage, Alaska. One of their reporters talked with Carrie Skaggs, who was standing outside of her home with a bottle of whiskey after the earthquake. Quoting now, I grabbed the essentials, Skaggs said. Birth certificate, passport, and Pappy Van Winkle, she said, cradling the bottle in the crook of her elbow. Clearly, someone's priorities are in order. If you have something you'd like to share with whiskey lovers from around the world, well, you can always email us. The address is comments at whiskeycast.com, or you can get in touch with us on Twitter, Facebook, or Instagram at WhiskeyCast. Your voice is presented by Lot 40, Canada's award-winning 100% pot still rye whiskey. Lot 40 unapologetically Canadian. Please drink responsibly. Let's wrap things up now with Behind the Label, our look at the history, science, and other things that make whiskey unique. One of those things is the willingness of whiskey brands to let average whiskey lovers help shape a whiskey that's actually going to be sold to the public. A few minutes ago, I shared my tasting notes for the Forty Creek Unity Canadian Whiskey, that final blend was selected by a panel of five whiskey lovers chosen from all over Canada last spring in a Facebook competition. Brian Belmore of New Brunswick was one of those picked to travel to the distillery in Grimsby, Ontario, and work with Forty Creek whiskey maker Bill Ashburn. I went up by myself. I was chosen out of uh, the only person out of Atlanta, Canada chosen. Uh, when I got up there, I'd never met anybody. Uh, we were five total strangers. Uh, first night we were there, uh, went, to, went out for dinner, met everybody, kind of got to know everybody. Had a few wobbly pops in, included with that. But uh, no, we, uh, we all we got to know each other pretty quickly, uh, got to understand. All came over, all for our love of whiskey in general. But uh, no, it was, uh, we got to know each other. We, we all still talk uh, once in a while through uh, social media. But uh, no, it was all around just a great experience. What was it like trying to create a blend that all of you could agree on? Uh, personally, it was hard. We wanted to make a whiskey that everybody would enjoy. Uh, and so we didn't want to let Forty Creek down, basically, is what we were trying to do. We were all worried that we might like it, but not everybody else would like it. So that was the worry. Uh, or that was the major concern for us until the whiskey was released, uh, Whiskey Weekend at Forty Creek Distillery. I can tell you that you didn't let anybody down because I liked it. Well, that's great to know because we were worried for months about that, uh, just not knowing. But uh, we knew it was a good liquid. We just didn't know uh, how great it actually was. And this was your first experience at blending anything, right? Uh, exactly. Uh, it was just out of a whim, but they they gave us a crash course on going through the different whiskeys and how what the flavor profile does 
and uh, all morning of drinking, and we sat down in the afternoon and spent uh, almost two hours in the boardroom finalizing the decision. And you're ready to come back for the 2019 version, right? Oh, yes. Oh, yeah. No, I'll, I'll probably be there for that, too. But uh, at, least there, at least there for the release. I don't know if they'll invite us back again, but uh, it was definitely a once-in-a-lifetime opportunity. Of course, the extreme version of this came back in 2014 when Glenn Morangy's Cask Masters project let consumers vote among three different cask types, along with the name, the label design, and even where the launch party should be held. You'll find my tasting notes for the Glenmorangie Tacta at our website. And if you have something you'd like us to look at on Behind the Label, just use the contact form at whiskeycast.com to get in touch with us. Behind the Label is brought to you by Writer's Tears. Writer's Tears Copper Pot, an 18th century style of premium Irish whiskey blended from single pot still and single malt. Like yourself, it's one of life's treasured rarities, and what's rare is wonderful. Writer's Tears Copper Pot. That's all for this episode of Whiskey Cast. We're on the web at whiskeycast.com, and that's where you'll find links for the stories in this episode, along with our Whiskey Cast HD videos and the Whiskey Cast Tasting Panel podcast, the latest whiskey news, events, the whiskey photo of the week, and much more. If you're going to be spending time with family and friends over the holidays, why not share Whiskey Cast with them? Take just a minute and show them how to use the podcast app on their smartphone to discover Whiskey Cast and a whole world of free content from podcasters all over the world. It's the best gift you could give them, and it's free. You can also help spread the word by posting reviews and ratings for Whiskey Cast on Apple Podcasts or wherever you get your podcasts from. Those reviews and ratings do get figured into the search results that help other whiskey lovers find out about Whiskey Cast when they're looking for podcasts. Our Cask Strength Conversation continues all week long online. Look for us on Twitter, Instagram, and Facebook at Whiskey Cast. And you can always email us. The address is comments at whiskeycast.com. Whiskey Cast. Brought to you by Redbreast. The definitive single pot still Irish whiskey. Those in the know, no Redbreast. This is whiskey. Johnny Walker's Scotch whiskey. From this place and these people. I, Scotch Makers, creating the bold and complex flavour of Johnny Walker Black Label. Step right up. Whiskey Cast is a production of Cask Strength Media, copyright 2018, and comes to you from the charming, yet regrettably dry town of Haddonfield, New Jersey. I'm Mark Gillespie, reminding you that when you drink, please drink responsibly. Thanks for listening.